Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about uh, my book, Wasteland with Words. Uh, I would like to thank Jason and uh, Senna for uh, arranging the whole thing. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a presentation of my book or just uh, talk about the Icelandic society in the 18th and the 19th century. And uh, uh, and uh, then we will meet in April and uh, you can ask me any question you want to about uh, uh, Icelandic societies or Icelandic history or myself, whatever you want to ask about. Uh, let me just uh, go back uh, here and uh, find my uh, find my slides and so we can actually start there we are um, the the drawing there is from Solon Islandus Sölvi Helgason uh, you who have been in Reykjavik you might have stopped by a cafe in Bankastræti Solon Islandus uh, it's been there for quite a while. Uh, Solon was a hobo or uh, unusual free-spirited guy who was famous for his drawings and all, all kinds of uh, stuff which he, he did when he was uh, 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 traveling from one place to another. He was uh, certainly one of the famous people in Iceland. Uh, let me just uh, start by uh, telling you a little bit about the Wasteland book. It, it came out 2010, uh, in May 2010, and early May. And if you remember right, uh, in uh, sometimes in May, the Eyjafjallar eruption uh, took place, uh, volcanic eruption, which kind of stopped all air trafficking uh, in, in, in Europe for a few days. So my publisher was incredibly happy, was probably the only one in, in Europe who was happy for, uh, for the Eyjafjallar, uh, eruption because, uh, everyone was talking about Iceland and he had a book out, uh, Wasteland book was out in the market, had been for maybe two weeks when this, uh, uh incident occurred. Uh, in the end of May, and that made, made him even more happy, uh, the Economist published a, a review on the book uh, and uh, that made a huge difference for the book. It was literally, uh, you could uh, buy it all over the world, in Australia, in, in all the European countries, America, South America, Canada. And uh, it was on the new release table in, in all these countries. And, uh, and uh, so it made a huge difference. The Economist is such a, a well-known uh, uh, um, uh, journal that uh, it, it went, it, it, its reputation went all over the country. Uh, two years later, uh, Edward, uh, Edward uh, Lucas, who uh, wrote the review, uh, sent me an email and uh, told me that he was coming uh, for the weekend with his son. And he wanted to meet me and I invited him home for a coffee or tea and, and, and cake. Uh, very, very nice man. And we talked about uh, uh, everything. And, uh, and he told me that he was actually one of the editors of The Economist. And his, he specialized in Eastern Europe. And I was surprised and said, well, why did, why did you uh, write a review about my book if, if Eastern Europe is, is your field? And he said, well, I was on my way home for the weekend. And when you leave the office, there's a huge table full of books. And I reached out and pulled out one. And the one was the Wasteland book. He took it home, read it and decided to like it and decided to write the review. And it's one of these incidents that made a huge difference, both for me and of course for the publisher, because it was sold all over the world. Let me give you uh, my autobiography. I, I am, I, I live in Reykjavik. I'm a professor of cultural history at the University of Iceland, uh, married to another professor in economics, Tina Levi Ausgestotir. And we have uh, one son who is a student in Berlin now in musical production. He's 21 uh, one years old. Uh, and this is my scholarly uh, biography here. Uh, 
I, I got my BA uh, degree in Iceland at the University of Iceland and I moved to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, got my PhD in 1993 at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, loved my state in Pittsburgh and I actually loved to be in America. And I, I had planned to uh, apply for a job there. But in the end, I got a handsome grant here, here in Iceland, a three-year grant. Which, uh, so I moved back and started to do my research here in Iceland and ended up being here for, uh, uh, for the rest of my life, so to speak. I am an author of approximately 30 books, uh, most of them in Icelandic, but some uh, eight of them actually published in, in, in English. And the Wasteland book is for sure uh, one of them. Uh, you see the, the covers of, of most of my books over there. Uh, I'm also an editor of a, a book series, Icelandic book series, called Sinispaigur Íslenskar Altidemenningar, or Anthology of Icelandic Popular Culture. And uh, 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 we have been publishing this from 1997. Uh, the first book, The Brothers from the Stranda Commune, uh, I will talk about them a little later, uh, was the first book. And it's excerpts from uh, diaries, uh, the collections of letters and uh, all uh, or ego documents in general. The other one deals with the micro history and uh, that's the methodology which I have been, I have adopted in my research and I am an editor of a book series called Micro Histories with, uh, and the co-editor of mine is Istavan M. Siarto, a Hungarian microhistorian. And we have been uh, editing this from uh, 2016 and publishing approximately 20 books and more to come. Uh, this is published by Routlets, which is a very well known uh, uh, publishing house, uh, international publishing house. Uh, so I actually get to know quite a lot of uh, foreign scholars from, uh, scholars from all over the world which is a great treat and uh, makes a huge difference for me. Uh, let's look at the structure of the Icelandic peasant society in the 18th, 19th century. Uh, it's of course the, uh, the state, which was the king from, uh, for, for most part of the, uh, our story. The commune was a, was a huge part of the Icelandic society. That's where uh, the distribution of poor relief uh, took part, which was more or less what, what the commune did. The family played a huge role in, 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 in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the structure of the society. The head of the household was the, uh, the husband, but he, he, uh, uh, controlled the, the family, uh, often three generation family along with his wife. Uh, children were a huge part of their, uh, uh, their workforce and uh, my focus has mostly been on individuals and uh, the individual in, in society, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the way in which the micro historians do their business, basically. Uh, I am going to be focusing a little bit on uh, what we might call the barefoot historians. And, and the definition is, uh, as you can read there, barefoot historians, a group of uneducated lay scholars in the 18th century who, with great energy and zeal, wrote up material from previous centuries for the use of their friends and relatives. And these were people who actually created themselves a lot of uh, stuff. It's not only that they were not their only, you know, uh, writing up uh, old stuff, they, they also created themselves. These people came to constitute what can almost be seen as a kind of an informal institute of culture and their importance for the continuity of and development of popular culture in Iceland is impossible to overestimate. Uh, you know uh, Haldor and uh, Niels Jonsson. Uh, these are their manuscripts and it's just the uh, quantity of it is just unbelievable. Uh, when I moved back in 1994 to Iceland, the, the first thing I did was going down to the manuscript department of the National Library. Uh, and I met there a, a good old schoolmate of mine, Kauri Bjarnason, uh, who uh, kind of brought me uh, into the manuscript department and showed me around. And uh, 
What I started was I, I, I had written a doctoral dissertation about the everyday life of, uh, of Icelanders and you know, kind of popular culture in Europe from the uh, uh, middle of the 19th century and up to the middle of the 20th century. And uh, I, I, so I, I thought I knew quite well uh, how the society had developed, but uh, getting an access to the diaries and collections of letters and the private sources made really changed my view of of the society uh, a great deal. And Kauri was an instrumental in in bringing me sources, which made a huge difference for my for my scholarship. And I started to focus on handwritten uh, newspapers and they were a specific phenomena uh, from the peasant society in the late 19th century where young people mostly decided to actually pretend that they were uh, publishing a real newspapers and uh, they wrote them up by hand and they passed them from maybe from farm to farms in their commune maybe 10 farms or 15 farms and each far, uh, family paid a minimum fee for reading it up in the uh, Winter Eve gatherings. And a lot of them, uh, a lot of these newspapers are uh, kept in the manuscript department and they give you a certain insight into what people, what was on people's mind, especially young people's mind. And I studied them for quite a while and uh, went over, you know, dozens of them. Uh, and they, they gave me a very strong uh, ideas about what the, uh, peasant society in the late 19th century was all about. But then uh, I, I, I asked uh, Kauri to bring me a, a, a list of all the diaries he, he had at the manuscript department and there, I stopped by the name of Haldor Jonsson because I remembered Haldor Jonsson had uh, written a hand, had made a handwritten newspaper and it was really, really well written. And if you are going to be studying, you know, diaries like this and you see on the photos there, it is really important for you to, uh, that you, it's, that it's going to be easy to read them. So, uh, so I, I, uh, uh, I asked him to bring me the, his diaries and, uh, certainly, uh, I had, uh, you know, 24 years of diary writing from a young, poor peasant in, in, uh, in, in the West Fjörder area in Strandir, the Strandir commune. And uh, when I started to read, it just, I, I entered a, a new dimension in, in my understanding of the 19th century. And I hadn't really written, uh, uh, read uh, a lot for long when I, he mentioned that his brother, Niels Jonsson, or Nilly as he called him, uh, had, uh, was keeping a diary too. So I asked Kauri to bring me, well, I asked him whether he had the diaries of Niels Jonsson and he brought me 40 years of uh, diary writing and I was I thought uh, that I was really in business there because I read you know both diaries uh, simultaneously and uh, it was just such an a treat to to get to know them and uh, see how they actually dealt with their everyday life their regular life on the farm both as farm hands uh, uh, at their parents house and later as a, a, a young adult uh, uh, who had established their own, own uh, families. I hadn't really read uh, for long uh, Neil's uh, uh, diary when I realized that he had kept a specific book where he uh, documented all visits in, in his house, uh, all letters he had written and read, uh, and all uh, uh, yeah, well, and, uh, and letters from his fiance. So I asked Kauri to uh, try to find these documents in the manuscript department, and he brought me a box of candy. It was empty, there was no candy in it, but they were full of letters from uh, Niels and uh, to his, uh, his fiance, Gudrun Bjarnadottir, who lived in Gjögur, which is uh, in the Stranda commune. Uh, and uh, these are the love letters and that kind of revolutionized my idea about you know how I was going to approach the uh, the 19th century I was going to write about the history of uh, uh, of emotions and uh, I focused very much on love or grief 
and uh, wrote a book which was called Education, Love and Grief, or Mentun, Ost, or Sork. Uh, I, I, I tell this story a little bit in the book, as you know, and uh, the, their relationship had a very tragic ending, as, as you re might remember. I talk about it in the introduction of, of the Westland book. But none, no, nonetheless, uh, these sources are really remarkable and uh, made a huge difference for me, uh, for my scholarship and my focus in, as a historian uh, on the 18th and the 19th century society. Uh, I am going to talk about the barefoot historians. That was, uh, that's the reason I, I defined uh, 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 at the beginning how, how they were defined, because I'm going to bring you a new uh, barefoot historians, which I did not discuss in the book, which is called Jon Bjarnason, and he was born in the end of the 18th century in Thormos Tunka in Vastalur, which is in Hunavasisla, in the northern, northern part of Iceland. Really no education except for these uh, preparation for the confirmation. Uh, his parents were first poor, but uh, rose in their uh, social standing. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, his interests were reading and ri uh, writing, uh, mathematics and astronomy. Uh, and he, he was definitely an incredibly smart guy. Uh, he was always in contact with uh, the head teacher of the Latin school in Reykjavik, who was born in the same commune as he was. He was an older uh, person, but they were pen pals for decades. And that maybe made a huge difference for him uh, in terms of access to uh, sources and stuff like that. So he wrote approximately 400 manuscripts, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, his major, uh, one of his major accomplishments, accomplishment, which was an encyclopedia, uh, which he uh, created from 1845 to 1852. Uh, and uh, there are seven large volumes, two small ones, uh, as you can see here, uh, and uh, it is basically about the creation of the world and the development of the species. And one volume, the, the, the volume number three, uh, has approximately only drawings, approximately 500 drawings. Uh, and uh, he, he is very systematic in his approach. Uh, he marks the drawings if, uh, if he had a specific model, uh, he, he marks it on A. Uh, if he had, uh, uh, if, if he cut uh, 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 photos from uh, or or drawings from uh, from other uh, sources, he had he marked them B, or if he made them himself, he was marked C. So he was he was like he, he worked like an uh, uh, educated person, uh, a person uh, who uh, enjoyed the enlightenment because enlightenment was dripping down to the Icelandic peasantry in the late 19th century. Uh, the, uh, even though it was, uh, uh, the, the enlightenment, as you know, uh, started in the 18th century in France. So, uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of what kind of drawings we are talking about, here he, he, he for example, talks about all the different races and categorizes them and discuss their uh, how they are uh, their uh, their identity kind of and they, he of course placed the white race on the top and then he goes down the list uh, and here you have a south world people Söder Alvu uh, folk uh, sometimes called the blue people or blow men uh, and in other places called the negroes uh, this is uh, th this is the uh, text uh, under the, uh, the photos uh, under the drawings, and you see how he categorized them and refers to text in the other uh, in the other volume. Uh, he was interested in giants and dwarfs or, or odd looking people, uh, uh, and and then you have uh, all kinds of uh, animals. Here's a scorpion, a bull, a kangaroo, a kangaroo. And this is the Icelandic version of a kangaroo. Uh, it's kind of a mixture of a dog or a, and a sheep and a, you know, a creature which he called a kangaroo. Uh, and because he was, uh, worked like an educated person, he referred to books where he got his model. And the, the, here he is referring to a, 
a Danish book, which was published just around the same time he was doing the uh, the encyclopedia. Uh, here is Bat, uh, and again you see how he categorized them on the top. Very interesting, and you see the letters B and C and uh, uh, their uh, uh, whale, uh, and of course a monster, sea monsters. He was very interested in monsters. Uh, this is sea uh, troll or and sea uh, wonder, and but. The good news was that he he specifically said that he would never talk about the monsters unless he had a very uh, definite and good source for their existence, orally, of course. And here you have more monsters, monsters with hats and many hats and wings, uh, quite the remarkable uh, uh, drawings. I actually have uh, a tattoo of, of this drawing here uh, on, on my hand. So I, t I take my uh, scholarship very seriously, as you can tell. Uh, so the question is, of course, how can we explain Jon the farmer and other barefoot historians? What kind of, I mean, we are talking about a very, very uh, poor peasant society, but these guys create all these sources and these remarkable sources. Uh, and I focus on the culture of emotions, the fact that people were, uh, uh, the grief was uh, hanging over people's life every day, basically, through, a, uh, through their whole life, uh, made a huge difference. And uh, one way of escaping the grief was to uh, dive into the written culture, to, to read about the Icelandic sagas and, and uh, get, get a, a model for uh, dealing with uh, hardship. Uh, that's what you got from reading all this uh, stuff, and one of the one of it was poetry, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Lack of material good. I I just finished a, a huge research project, which I I was the PA, the principal investigator, uh, where we focused on uh, uh, inventories, poor people's uh, homes, inventories of people who owned something to to the commune, and you can tell there uh, it's approximately. 30,000 inventories from the 1918 and the 19th century. It's just amazing how little people actually owned. <clears throat> but what they could do was they could create uh, something written material. When you had uh, a pen and a paper, you can make something of it. And uh, that was one of the material goods which they could actually create and was worth something. I have actually dealt a little with the memory process in the country, collective memory, historical memory, individual memory, and I have argued that the memory process in Iceland was different than, for example, in European societies, where societies which were based up on the village community, where collective memory was incredibly strong, historical memory very weak, because uh, uh, before the formation of the nation state, and this combination of collective and historical memory meant that the uh, individual memory was very weak. But it's the opposite in Iceland. Collective memory very weak because there were absolutely no villages in Iceland. Uh, the farmsteads were scattered around the coast. <coughs> Excuse me. But at the same time, historical memory was rising, both because of the Icelandic sagas which kind of gave the, uh, the Icelanders a certain identity, and also the independent movement, which was for, uh, was uh, being formed in the 19th century and had a huge difference on, uh, on the Icelandic population. And uh, this meant that when the collective memory was weak and historical memory on the, uh, uh, rising, you had a space for individual memory. And that's one of the reasons, I would argue, that a lot of people saw reason to step into the open space, the creative space, and create something for themselves. And also just to make the argument that they were part of the independent movement. They were describing how they took part in, uh, in forming the, the young uh, republic, which later became, you know, in the, in the 20th century. So that's part of the argument, because we do have to ask ourselves, how was it possible that these guys uh, went about doing their business as they did? Jon the farmer, the brothers from the Stanta commune, and others, which I will talk a little later. How, I mean, how, how can we explain them? So 
their everyday life in the 19th century. How did the creative class, which we have been discussing, influence the general public and their daily affairs? The idea of a foreign land became part of the culture because these guys were telling stories from foreign uh, foreign lands. And Napoleon was a household item in, in, in the in the in the Balstova in in the winter eve gatherings in Iceland because stories of Napoleon and other politicians in Europe, they were part of the discussions in the Icelandic farmstead. The idea of an abstract thought being, became part of their daily life. I mean, just all this poetry and the, the discussions uh, in the Icelandic uh, Badstova in the, in, in the inter winter eve gatherings about the structure of the poetry and the meaning of the words and, uh, and the ideas which were, you know, thrown around meant that the Icelanders, they, they were used to actually dealing with fairly abstract thoughts. And the idea of progress became part of the survival uh, strategy. Uh, that's very important. And we see that through the life of Niels and uh, Halldór Jónsson. They, they felt that they needed to uh, better themselves. And that was the, one of the reasons they were so interested in education. And the idea of progress to to uh, move on in their life, move out of their poetry and, uh, and, and try to better themselves was just a very strong threat in all their life. So I have dealt with more of these barefoot historians. For example, Magnus Magnusson in this book, uh, Education, uh, Emotional Experience and Microhistory, a life story of a destitute pauper, pauper poet in the 19th century. Magnus was, of course, uh, uh, made famous by Halder Laxness in, in uh, World Light, Heimsljus, his uh, epic story as uh, Olavur uh, Kárason Ljusvíkingur. Uh, I have, I actually dealt with, uh, I've dealt with Magnus, uh, Magnusson and his sources for a, a long time. And I wrote this book, which was published, I think, 2020 by Rodlets. Uh, the other book uh, uh, to the uh, the book to the right, minor knowledge and microhistory, um, uh, manuscript culture in the 19th century. That's a book which I wrote with my friend and uh, fellow scholar uh, David Olson, which deals basically with the man manuscript culture, the, the stuff which I am discussing here. It came out 2017, if I remember right, from Radlets. And the book in the middle was published in December, uh, last December, by Bloomsbury, a very well-known international uh, publishing house. It's called Autobiographical Traditions in Ego Documents, uh, Icelandic Literary Practices. All of these books kind of deal with, in one way or another, uh, these peasant uh, poets and uh, scholars and how they enrich their uh, environment in the 18th and the 19th century. Their influences, the barefoot historians, however, unofficial channels of distributions, the underground press, they are almost like the people's press. Because what they did, they were always doing it not only for themselves, but also for their neighbors. So they passed the manuscript from one farm to another. And some of them actually commissioned work. I mean, they were asked to create some specific uh, uh, work for uh, the ne neighboring farmer. So it, it's incredible actually to uh, to see how these barefoot historians became kind of the glue who held the Icelandic popular culture together, uh, giving children, youngsters, and uh, the fact people of all ages a chance to immerse in themselves uh, in the world of the sagas and traditional poetry. Because you have to remember that Published books at this time were only ba basically relig of a religious nature. So, what is a minor knowledge? Is uh, that's the name of the, the book we David and I uh, uh, published. Once we break out of the traditional boundaries of standardized processes of scholarship into unexplored areas of local knowledge, we can hope to come across material that may see new light on institutional structures and thus force us to uh, question our received and accepted notions of them. In other words, traditional history, uh, for example, political history, they, don't, they never really look for material in the local communities. I mean, uh, 
the local tra uh, tale tradition, for example, in Iceland is so rich of material about the general public, which the traditional historians never really looked to, uh, because it didn't really approach great historical questions. And so uh, that's basically what we have done. We have looked at the local knowledge to give us a chance to reevaluate how history in the past was uh, developed. Let me go back to Westfjordur. Westfjordur, uh, th this is the area uh, where the barefoot historians, which we have mentioned already, uh, this is the term which I love, skald irdingur in Icelandic, which is kind of a poet, uh, uh, scholar. Uh, it's, a, it's a word no one really uses today, but <laughs> I, it comes from Magnus Magnusson, uh, and it basically means those who create poetry, copy text, and did some scholarly work. And you have a photo there of Magnus, and this is the book, our book, Minor Knowledge and Minor Microhistory. Uh, the life of Magnus is just remarkable. He's born 1873, uh, and uh, he is uh, he is uh, uh, an orphan from uh, early age, and uh, had a very hard life. Most of his life, sometimes he is uh, a semi-independent border, uh, sometimes uh, a landless laborer, and occasionally a, a school teacher. Uh, he lived he lived a very harsh. Uh, hard slide from cradle to grave, and uh, most of his time he is less a mother. He is he is independent laborer, and here you have you know uh, uh, some uh, items about his life. He's always looking for place where he could uh, uh, do his writing. He creates poetry and publishes his material as much as he can. He uh, uh, he's said to have uh, pub uh, written eleven thousand poetry. And he died 43 years old. Uh, he was father of six. Uh, just two of them uh, lived into uh, adulthood. Always incredibly poor. And uh, he actually uh, was put in prison, convicted of a rape of a 14-year-old girl. He writes about that incident and also uh, the year he stayed in, in prison in Reykjavik. And, uh, probably the only... Uh, prison uh, diary we have in Iceland from at least in, in uh, from uh, most of the 20th century. Uh, Magnus created a list which is kind of a remarkable list of 210 poet scholars, Skaldirdingar, uh, and it was just like a roadmap of the West the West Fjordur. And uh, because he had to know where he was a welcome person. And he knew that people who shared his interest, they would welcome him. And he talks about it in his diary when he visited some specific person, how they actually uh, just hang out, couldn't really, didn't really want to go to sleep because they were so interested in each other's works. And, and uh, so it, it's, it, it is kind of remarkable to read all these stories about, you know, how people got together and how close these people got. I published his diary in 1998, uh, 1998, yes, uh, in, in my book series, The Anthology of po Icelandic Popular book Culture. It was book number two, and uh, so I have been working with him quite a lot for, throughout the years. Uh, the five uh, in the forefront, uh, these are Magnus uh, Magnusson, uh, Sigvadu Grimsson Borgfyringur, Thordur Thordason Grunvikingur, Haldor and Niels Jonsson. I mean, these are the five guys who kind of formed a network in the West Fjordur area and exchanged of material. They knew of each other and, you know, they, they worked together and uh, created a lot of material for the general public to read and enjoy. Uh, let me just take an example of Sigurd of Grims from Borgfinningur. My friend David Olofsson, I mentioned before, he uh, wrote a doctoral dissertation about him and his work uh, in uh, uh, defended his doctoral dissertation in... Uh, in, uh, let me see, uh, 2008 from uh, St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, Sigvadur uh, kept a diary for uh, uh, no less than uh, 67 years. He uh, wrote, a, he wrote a, a very important document for genealogy, uh, research on genealogy in Iceland. He 20,000 pages 
which is basically genealogy of all priests in Iceland from the settlement up to nine, uh, nine, uh, 1900. Uh, and I mean, this is that database with uh, all everyone uh, interested in genealogy uh, it takes a look at. Uh, Sigvaldur genealogy, as you might know, is the pastime of the Icelanders, or has been for a very long time. Uh, the document which uh, Sigvaldur created is, uh, is fundamental in, in, in that sense. Uh, so, uh, diary writing is, I mean, he, he his diary is, uh, is approximately 20,000 pages. Uh, I am myself a, a diary writer. This is book number 77. And I think uh, I have already written approximately um, twenty-five thousand pages. So I, I have, uh, I have, I am, I have, I have written more in my diary than Sigurd the Green from that, and that is quite a lot. Proud of that. So, as you know, the farm work uh, was very labor-intensive. Everyone took part in the work, uh, both uh, youngsters and the older people. Everyone who could move were put to work. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, uh, well, here we have a peasant family. Uh, just This is probably uh, people, this is a, a photo taken in uh, 1882. This is pe uh, probably people who are uh, fairly well off. Uh, and But look at the housing. Uh, it's uh, The house is just really uh, in a very poor po uh, uh, condition as a lot of poor houses in Iceland at the time. Uh, around uh, 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 the sheep was uh, a tradition which everyone loved in, in, in the peasant society. It was in uh, the sheep were taken into the interior in, in, in the spring, early spring, maybe uh, May, uh, June, and uh, they were gathered in September and rounded up. This is a Havravatsjet, which is just outside of Reykjavik. Uh, my uh, my wife's grandmother actually uh, has a summer house in the neighborhood of this. And uh, it's still standing actually. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, th th this is one of the highlights of the working uh, uh, year for every farmer to actually get together, uh, round up the sheep and bring them back home. Uh, of the winter reap gatherings, we have mentioned that uh, a number of times. Uh, the one, uh, the photo from the left is probably uh, a setup. Uh, it's not a regular, a regular farmhouse uh, setting, uh, but uh, you see one reading uh, under the lamp. Uh, other people are doing work. Uh, the kids are playing with their toys, and then you have from uh, winter eve gathering in the 20th century, probably 1920 or something like that. The woman is working on the wool. The, the one boy is knitting and the other one is reading. I mean, so the tradition kept on into the 20th century in the urban areas. Uh, fishing was, of course, part of the peasant society. Uh, farmers sent their servants down to the shore to fish on open boats. Very dangerous, very dangerous uh, since the vessels were open. Uh, and uh, as you see there, and uh, the water is very, very dangerous. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean was very dangerous, even though the fishing banks were very, uh, very uh, lucrative. Um, horses being exported to England, uh, that made a huge difference for the immigration to America. Later on, people sold both sheep and horses before that uh, uh, and, and got money instead of uh, goods. Uh, which, I mean, money wasn't really uh, around uh, before that. So that made people, it would m made it possible for people to actually uh, go to uh, move to America, which, uh, you know, around 20,000 people did, if I remember right. And you know more about that story than I do, actually. But uh, this was a very important part of the Icelandic uh, history in the, in the 19, uh, late 19th century. Children, uh, you know, children's work. I actually, my doctoral dissertation dealt a lot with children in the 19th century. Um, they were treated like, more, almost like an adult from early age. From the age of five, they, they got their first job. And then uh, their uh, in, uh, responsibilities increased from, uh, from one uh, 
uh, after uh, after uh, as they grew old, and uh, after the confirmation, they were uh, accepted like adults basically, and they were confirmed at the age of fourteen. Uh, just to give you an example of, uh, uh, I, I was raised up in a middle class family in the west end of Reykjavik, uh, and uh, uh, fairly uh, upper class, middle class family. Uh, from the age of six, I was sent to a farm to work uh, and to get acquainted with the uh, farm work. And I was there for 10 years. I changed families for, you know, for four months every year. That's incredible, actually. But uh, I loved it and I liked it a lot. And uh, every year I went, you know, in May and came back in September and to, you know, in to go to school. And so... Uh, Reykjavik was basically empty of children uh, when I was growing up, and I was—I am born 1957, so that—that that was just the way people did it in in the, in in those days in the 20th century. Uh, Confirmation—we mentioned that before. I mean, that was a huge uh, event for a, a, any commune, both for the children and, of course, people got together. There were not very many occasions where people uh, got together. It was mostly around, you know, the church. But uh, housing were, it didn't really allow for any, there were no community housing or anything like that. It was mostly around the church calendar. My grandfather, Helge Magnusson, was uh, born 1872, like all, most of these guys I have been talking about. Uh, he uh, was born in, uh, uh, in, in the rural areas in, in the southern part of Iceland. He moved around to... Uh, when he was 20 years old and became a blacksmith in Reykjavik. Uh, was uh, later a merchant in, 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 in Reykjavik. And he actually installed the sewer system in Reykjavik and the hot and the cold water too. Uh, he lived in Bankastræti. You, have been, uh, you who have been traveling to Iceland, you know Bankastræti is one of the main streets in uh, Reykjavik. You see the uh, Stjórnarås, who's uh, the the office building for the prime minister is there, but he uh, built houses uh, just a, uh, a little uh, higher up in the Bankestrati. And my family lived there for almost 70 years. My grandfather, as a part of the bourgeoisie, he uh, withdrew every day from uh, his family life. Uh, and he had a, a small room in the basement. And there he had... Uh, photos of uh, Trumps and hobos, people who were the famous people in the 19th century. And he just loved to flick through them. Sometimes he invited some of his friends down there. They had maybe a glass of cognac or something like that and looked at them like, you know, baseball cards or something or, 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 or pictures of actors. Or, but th th these were just something that reminded them on the old days from the 19th century. I published uh, these, uh, this collection of photos, which he didn't really take them, but he collected them. And I published them in 2004 in his memory and the memory of my father, Magnus Helgason, who was, uh, 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 ran a paint factory in, in Reykjavik for 40 years. Uh, and uh, it was called Snöggir Blättir, or Soft Spots, and was published in 2004. And later, 2021, I used the collection in, in a book which I wrote for Rodlets, uh, and you see the cover over there, Archives, Law, Ideology, and Ego Documents as Microhistorical Autobiography. Potential History is the subtitle. Uh, and these are the guys uh, uh, my uh, grandfather loved to uh, take a look at, Love Brandur and the Rat Pedersen, and many, many others. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, 19th century society was almost without any uh, infrastructure, no roads, no, bu no buildings. Um, and uh, so if you had to uh, deliver, a, a, a send a letter, letter from one uh, part of the country to another, you, you were in trouble. And you sometimes you used the migrant workers who were uh, traveling from a farmstead to uh, the coastal area to, to take a letter and deliver it. And later in the, in the 18th century, the, uh, the postal service, uh, you see a photo of, 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 of land poster, as it was called in, in Icelandic, who, who, who delivered uh, uh, letters uh, and, and books from uh, one part of the country to another. 
in the urban in the nineteenth in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, uh, the fishing industry increased incredibly, and uh, the fish pro processing the processing of the fish was part big part of the opportunity to for poor people to actually move to urban areas and uh, step out on the service uh, uh, class and became become independent in the urban areas and a lot of women worked on outdoor uh, outdoor to work on the on, on the on the cats uh, here we have a middle class uh, family in the 20th century uh, a woman in in her traditional dress probably this woman is uh, probably born in the peasant society uh, moves to her daughter or or, or son you know, became a middle class uh, uh, or become a middle class family. Even. So it's a kind of a nice photo, photo from Reykjavik. And uh, you have children and, uh, you know, the wife of, uh, and, and the grandmother. Yes, road building was one of the big tasks in the 20th century because there were absolutely no roads in the 19th century. Uh, women, uh, before uh, installing the, the water system in Reykjavik, women, uh, had to go up to Laugardalur. Uh, it's uh, where the national uh, uh, national stadium is now today, the soccer stadium in, in Laugardalur. Uh, women took their laundry up there and uh, did uh, did all the washing, washing for the family. Children at work in the 20th century. It's a kind of a nice, a nice photo. Uh, Travelers, uh, 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 travelers changed the economy of the country in the early 20th century. And, you know, there were a lot of families who, who, uh, who had their livelihood of, uh, from the travelers, both of the fishermen and also the work people working, processing the fish. Uh, well, fishing was in, in the North Atlantic Ocean is took its toll, uh, not only from Icelanders, but also from uh, British sea, seamen from uh, sailors from uh, England, France, uh, Spain, uh, Germany. Uh, I mean, they, they were. It was a it was a regular occasion that people died on, on in the ocean, and death was for sure. I mean, we have uh, infant mortality in the middle of the nineteenth century is uh, is around thirty five percent, and uh, people dying uh, from uh, let's say from the age of one to five was just a regular occasion. Uh, Matthias Jökulsson, the uh, poet laureate from uh, born uh, 1835, he wrote a very famous autobiography, uh, The Story of My Life. Uh, uh, he tells the story when he was nine years old, a uh, guest in a house of her relative. They lost in one week four children. Uh, at this uh, eighth bracket for, from one to five. And his second wife, he was married three times, his second wife lost the same week in the same commune, uh, six brothers and sisters. And the question is for a historian, how do you survive that? How can you really survive uh, to lose uh, six children in one, in one week? And that's a question which I have been dealing with and I connected a lot with education. Uh, when uh, the influx of uh, people to Reykjavik in the 20th century because of the fishing industry and other industry which picked up at the time, uh, housing situation was very poor and uh, the, these are, you know, uh, people from a very poor housing. This photo is actually on the cover of my first book which is called The Mode of Living in Reykjavik, 1930 to 1940 where I, I deal with the Great Depression in Reykjavik. Uh, and uh, and I, I went into uh, created one day in the fam five families of five uh, of, of in, in five families from different classes uh, to see how they actually managed to deal with the Great Depression. Uh, so I love this photo of, of young people and they're in the Sunday best probably. Uh, very interesting photo. Well, new new times uh, arrived with uh, the British. Uh, Occupation uh, in 1940, in the beginning of the uh, Second World War. Uh, this uh, young boy is running errands, probably uh, from the countryside, to trying a, a hitchhike to Reykjavik. Uh, 
and the housing boom in the post-war years. I mean, this every Icelanders recognize this the situation. People moved into their houses before they were finished, and you see the woman there on her way either from the house or uh, to her home. Uh, the whole neighborhoods were were in this situation basically. I decided to take this uh, photo too. It's important for the mentality of the Icelanders that the Danes were, uh, you know, our uh, uh, we were their colony, so to speak, for 600 years. Uh, they decided in 1971 to bring back the, all the important do documents, or basically they came to an agreement to form two. Institute, Arne Magne Institute in Reykjavik and another one in Copenhagen, where they share these incredibly variable uh, documents, which were created here in Iceland, but dealt with the Scandinavian history, not only the Icelandic history, the Scandinavian history. So it was just a very nice gesture of the Danes, I think. So this is the final photo of my son Peter. He's 70, uh, seven years old, probably there. And I, I wonder what happens to his future whether he is going to be part of Iceland or the Euro European community. Uh, Peter is now uh, 21 years old and lives in Berlin, as I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, I don't know exactly where his future is going to be, whether he's going to be, uh, <laughs> whether he's going to uh, uh, settle down in, in, uh, in Berlin, where he lives now, or whether he's going to go back to America. He was born in America, actually, and uh, in Florida. And uh, he speaks English fluently, much better than I do, actually. And uh, so he is probably the man of the world. And uh, uh, he, uh, you, you see the statue of Jon Sigurdsson looking at the Parliament of Iceland, Parliament of Iceland. And uh, no one really knows where Iceland is going to be in, in in the nearest future. But thank you, guys. Thanks for uh, for for this. Uh, uh, listen to my talk. I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say in April. Thank you. Bye-bye.